while his days, which he was finding harder and harder to face, were characterised by heavy drinking and self-sedation with marijuana. He found himself chain-smoking his untipped, lung-blackening senior service cigarettes one after another after another. Later, he would look back on the period and tell everyone that he'd almost had a nervous breakdown. From the outside, there appeared to be no almost about it. For the first time in his life, he felt utterly worthless. Every year he had been it since the age of 15 had been wrapped up in the band. Now, even though he, he could tell the world, that period of his life was almost certainly over. It was as if he'd suddenly and unexpectedly lost his job, been made entirely redundant. He was 27 and of no use to anyone anymore. Even the money he'd earned up to that point was no comfort, made no real difference. This was an identity crisis in extremis. Who exactly was he if he wasn't Beatle Paul McCartney? On the mornings when he forced himself to rise, he'd sit on the edge of his bed for a while before defeatedly crawling back under the covers. When he did get up and out of bed, he'd reach straight for the whiskey, his drinking creeping earlier and earlier into the day. By three in the afternoon, he was usually out of it. I hit the bottle, he admits. I hit the substances. He was eaten up with anger, at himself, an outside world. He can only describe it as a battling, empty feeling rolling across his soul. Out of work, and with nothing to distract him, the ghost from his past would rise up, whispering in his head, telling him, in spite of everything he'd achieved, that they knew he'd never really amount to anything. That he should have got a proper job in the first place, just as they always said. He realised up until that point he'd been a cocky sod. And now, there was this, the first serious blow of his confidence he'd ever experienced. Even when he was 14 and in his mistake to me he couldn't save his mother's life, he had known that the horrific event had been out with his control. Somehow now, in the depths of his muddied thinking, he was starting to believe that everything that was happening was nobody's fault but his own. His wife of less than a year felt the situation was frightening beyond belief. Within a matter of months, her new partner had gone from being a sparky, driven, world-famous rock star to a broken man who didn't want to set foot out of their bedroom. But even if Linda was scared, she knew she couldn't give up on Paul. She recognised that her husband was sinking into emotional quicksand, and she knew that it was down to her alone to pull him out before he went under for good. Linda saved me, he says, and it was all done in a sort of domestic setting. So that's how we start, basically. Um, and really, I mean, the, the whole idea with the title and stuff like that as well was, I kind of wanted it to be like a John Buchan novel or something, right, where, you know, you're kind of... Because, it, you know, having been in Abbey Road and blah, 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 I mean, obviously, Peter stopped too, and, um, and they were in the studio all the time, right? Um, and with this, I mean, he, in the 70s, he travelled a lot, you know, so it's almost this idea that we're kind of chasing this guy around the world, you know? Um, so that's kind of where that went. 